According to the Hacienda Inn's website, based in Prescott, Arizona, this hotel was built over the dried bones of an older hotel known as the Congress that burned down in 1923. Completed in 1927, shortly after the hotel opened, it suffered its first death. This is from a young woman named Faith Summers. When her and her husband checked into the balcony suite, and they only have one, which is room 426, her husband went out to buy cigarettes, didn't return, and three days later, Faith Summers committed suicide by either hanging herself from the balcony outside of the room or from a flagpole that used to be there. You can look and find a lot of sources online who have copied this story verbatim. The only problem is, is that as historians have already discovered, there is no record of anyone named Faith Summers that ever set foot in the state of Arizona. And a search of other documents can prove that this story is completely contrived. It never happened. Usually in other hotel legends, we find some element of that legend that is factual. In this case, there is none of it that's factual. This is your room, the balcony suite. It is a unique room all by itself um, and obviously has, uh, you know, it, its unique history. So does that mean that this hotel is not haunted? That there's no activity? No, there's activity here. Yes, indeedy. We did find some of it the first few hours we were in the room. Would, would you like me to wait uh, with the elevator for you? I don't care. You can. Yeah, yeah. Right. we'll be right back down. Okay. I just wanted to take a look at the room. It's just not coming from a story that they made up. Is your key? Yeah. Where is where To the left. To the left. To the left. Uh, your your other left. Up here. Right there. Right there. This is very nice. The state of Arizona is one of only a handful of states which regards death certificates and coroner inquests as a matter of public information and allows them available for viewing. There is a table outside. There should be. During research, I personally viewed 11,293 death certificates. Watch your step. Very nice. Isolating any that pertain to this hotel. All right, he's waiting on us, so we gotta go back down. Shut the door. Hmm? If we need to use the elevator down? Yeah. We're going to have to get our stuff and come in. You got your key, right? Yeah. Death certificates from the year 1927 and 1960 were analyzed. That's as far as Arizona takes it. The deaths pertaining to this property are here for viewing. I see so. The little gates to keep you from getting your arms caught in there, huh? And it doesn't. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, sorry about that. I'm. Uh, you're used to doing it by yourself. Um. Oh, yeah. We're yeah. We're not gonna stick our arms in there anyway, so you really don't have to worry about it. No. This, this is actually an additional thing. This was not on the original model. That was added um, as part of the remodel, I think, in uh, the yeah, 80s. in the 80s, huh? As I went to the car to retrieve the luggage, I began to wonder what it was like in the days when Tom Mix was here in the hotel. His picture still hangs in the hotel, and the chip that his horse left in the tile is still there also. Olden pics from the 1930 show that the theme has remained the same, only the furniture has changed over time. The Hatsayampa website also states that there are two other apparitions that have been seen here. The first, that of an old-style cowboy wearing an overcoat who walks the hallways and checks doors. They refer to him as the Night Watchman and a small child who is sometimes described as being Asian. Now normally if you were to look at these death certificates they are of course bright white. That is how they're posted. I've tinted them green because that's the color of my website and my YouTube channel is Paranormal Green and also in order to put them into a mode of parody so that they parody or provide an education or historical review of a document even though these are in the public domain by parenting we make sure that nobody has a complaint about it. The first death certificate that may be associated with the Haseampa Inn, here we can see the word Haseampa is the street address, was on February 6, 1931. That was four years after the Haseampa opened. It was a male, that of Edward J. Dillon. Mr. Dillon was 55 years old. He was a clerk. 
and he died of chronic myocarditis. That's usually virus related, but sometimes it can also be drug related, and they did put down here contributory was chronic alcoholism. So one way or another, this guy did in fact die either here at the Hacienda Inn or the other option is that there was a master plan community going on at the same time that the Haseapa Inn was built called the Haseapa Mountain Club. That was in another area of town and the two shared the same names. The coroner sometimes got the two death certificates of the places where they died mixed up but within a couple of years they began to sort it out and call the Haseapa the Haseapa Hotel and the Haseapa Mountain Club the Haseapa Mountain Club. We don't know which one this guy worked for because at this point they weren't really making clear on it. We're going to have to go in and look at the records a little bit better and see if we can figure it out. Now we go down here to the rest of the records you'll see that as far as the death certificates concerned it really doesn't say much on the bottom it just basically gives the surviving relatives and the uh, coroner that did the work um, the date that they did it on. So let's go on into the uh, rest of the records and see what we can find. Here is an example of one of those misleading death certificates. On July 17th of 1933, a five-year-old boy by the name of Clayton Finner Miller accidentally drowned. We scan down to the bottom of the page. We can see that it lists the accident as having in a public place at the Haseampa Pool. The Haseampa Inn does not, nor have they ever had a swimming pool. This swimming pool was at the Haseampa Mountain Club. And if you go into the Charlotte Hall Museum website, you can read an article about how it was the first swimming pool in the Prescott area, and after this accident was filled in. By 1937, here's the date. The coroner and the coroner's jury are now listing the death certificates according to the Haseampa Mountain Club or the Haseampa Hotel, respectively. This particular one is the last example from the Haseampa Mountain Club. Getting back to our first possible record of death, Mr. Edward Dillon. The 1930 census, that's a year before he died, shows him living with his sister at 127 North Marina. That's the side street that runs right next to the Haseampa Inn. Our good friend Google shows the relationship of each one, and that house, or at least where that house stood, is right next to where you park today. And across the street, way over there, is the parking, that's our car sitting right there. And that's where you'll park if you come here. You have to park across the street or in the morning, if you park out front, the police will tow your car. This is 127 North Marina, and right over here is where we parked when we came. The issue that raises questions in that 1930 census is that he lists his job as steward of a clubhouse. There is no clubhouse at the Haciampa Inn. That clubhouse was at the Mountain Club. So we really don't know which it is. Now, he might have lived directly across the street from the Haseampa, and maybe he worked at both places. Maybe he just walked across the street. One way or another, if he did die at the Haseampa Inn, he'd be a good candidate for this guy who's been seen walking around checking the doors at night. The night watchman, as they call him. And with the scant records that are left, we're never going to know one way or the other. more than convenient, I suppose. So they, they do say that um, the spirit of faith has been seen, but I'm sure, you know, the, the tour will have a lot more of the detailed history behind them, as, as well as uh, the stories over the years that have circulated. How long you worked here? I, I'm actually new myself. The next death that occurred in the hotel happened just a few years later on January 4th of 1934. Definitely happened at the hotel because it's marked right up here, death at Haciampa Hotel. Charles Otis La Tourette. Uh, he was 37 years old. He was a manager of Arizona Machine Company. Uh, I suppose he could also be a candidate for this night watchman guy. Although he didn't work at the hotel, he was not an employee. He did die in the hotel. I went about setting the equipment up in the room and testing the mic to make sure that it worked properly and that it was on channel one. That would be important later on in the story.
Here's the equipment set up at the Hacienda Hotel in Prescott, Arizona. Put all of the equipment that we could find on the desk, as in any other hotel, they are challenged as far as wall sockets are concerned. They basically rewired the hotel, and they've got a couple of uh, extension cords coming out. Maybe two or three wall plugs in the entire room at work. At 3.14 in the morning, the REM pod goes off all four lights and wakes us up. There is nothing that can set a REM pod off all four lights other than an electromagnetic field that is breaking the device's own electromagnetic field or a fluorescent light that is in direct proximity to it. And in this tape, you don't see any fluorescent lights. That's paranormal. Hey. Wow. That's some activity. By the time that I had grabbed the camcorder and gotten out of bed to try to make a capture on the camcorder, it had quit. It apparently figured out that it was being watched. Go ahead, set it off again. So this was our first hit, certainly not the last, and if there was no Faith Summers, then where did this activity come from? The next death that occurs at the Haseampa Hotel, and that's exactly what it listed as right there, occurs on August 9, 1939, is the first female death, that of Rose Blanche Williams. Female, 53-year-old. Uh, she dies, according to the coroner, of cirrhosis of the liver and cerebral hemorrhage. They're on the property in the hotel, so that death did occur on the hotel. There's no doubting that. I believe that this is the reason why there is activity in the room. There's something unusual about this death certificate that I uncovered that kind of set me back a little bit, and I'm going to come back to that. There are seven other deaths that occurred after this. I don't think any of them have anything to do with the activity. I'll tell you why, and then we're going to come to this one, and I'm going to show you why I think that this is the reason for the activity. The next death to occur a year later on July 7, 1940, is also a female, Mrs. Allen Richmond, and she was an employee at the Hacienda Hotel. However, this certificate says that her place of death was actually Arbor Gulch near Dewey. That's 18 miles away from the hotel and about a 30-minute drive by today's roads. Who knows how long it was in 1940. I think that because the, the informant in this that, uh, that notified uh, the coroner of the death, either the coroner or the police, was Jesse H. Richmond, who was also listed as her husband that that is probably correct that she did die at Dewey because I don't think her husband was in the habit of tagging along to work with her. She was a waitress, but I don't think she died in the hotel. I think that she died at home. Three quiet years go by and then on July 13, 1943, another female dies at the Hacienda and it's listed twice here, not only as the street number, but also at the location of the death. Uh, her name is Mrs. Jenny Zack. She's 65 years old. She dies from uh, Coronary occlusion and senility. Coronary occlusion means the heart seizes up. Uh, senility means that she's old. I could not find anything on this lady. Uh, apparently she came from Russia, was maybe staying there as a, just as a guest and got stuck there. The doctor put down here that he attended her from the 1st of July uh, until the 13th. So he was there on a regular basis and apparently was there at the time that she died because he listed that she lasted for two hours before death occurred and it means that he was present when it happened. I don't know why he didn't transport her to the hospital. Apparently he didn't think that she was that bad. She did die on the property. Uh, I'm not convinced that, uh, that there's anything connected to her at all. On May 26 of 1949, 49-year-old Millie F. Pelletier checked into the Hacienda Hotel, uh, got in a vehicle, drove on down US 66 towards Seligman, uh, had an auto accident and she died from instant death. Now, she wasn't in the hotel. Obviously, they listed her street address as the hotel, meaning that she had already checked in and that her belongings were there, which means that somebody 
got to go to the hotel, whether it was her husband, who's the one that was the reporter of the accident, or somebody in the hotel had to go up there and clean out her belongings immediately after she was killed. I find that to be a little bit more spooky than ghost hunting, actually. The following year, July 13, 1950, Lee Roland Petty, 61 years old, checked into the Haciampa Hotel. The coroner put down that he was from Maricopa County and Wickenburg, which, well, half of Wickenburg's in Maricopa County, and he also listed that he came here to be treated at the Veterans Administration Center. So apparently he checked into the hotel uh, coming from Wickenburg, checked into the Veterans Administration Center, and they list a whole list of things down here that uh, were the results of his uh, impending death, uh, even, even part of his foot being gangrenous. Uh, he had apparently checked into the Veterans Administration being a veteran to have these illnesses operated on and did not return to the hotel, which means that somebody had to clean out his room also. In November of 1952, 51-year-old Elizabeth Kite from Bakersfield, California checked into the Haciampa Hotel. According to the coroner's death certificate, she was only there an hour before she died. It was kind of messed up. I mean, the lady paid for a whole night. She only got to spend an hour. Uh, according to the coroner, she died of a coronary accident. It looks like he got kind of lazy on that one. This is the third woman to die in the Haciampa Hotel, but none of them fit the description of that elusive Faith Summers. Moving right along, December 31st, 1955, Charles William Fairfield from Clarkdale, which is just over the mountain from Prescott, checked into the Haciampa, and for some reason the coroner didn't list the uh, name of the hotel here. He put the address. 122 East Gurley is the address of the Haciampa. Uh, this guy was a secretary for some copper smelting firm. He stayed for two days and died of some kind of heart disease. Uh, another death in the Haciampa. And the last death certificate that I was able to access from the Haciampa Hotel is that of Everd Perrier. He died in 1959. Um, accordingly, he was sick and he was taken to the community hospital, so he did not actually die at the hotel, not a Haciampa death. Um, he is listed as being an executive in the petroleum industry, and that's kind of curious, considering the one death certificate I told you that we would go back to. Apparently, he had a whole bunch of things wrong with this cat. This cat had a whole lot of stuff wrong with him. But anyway, he didn't die in the hotel. So that's all of the death certificates that I can access. Um, Arizona won't let you access beyond 1960 because of privacy concerns. Could there have been others? Yes. But the activity in the hotel supposedly predates that period. Supposedly it goes back to when the hotel was built. So none of those would apply anyway. About 10 minutes later it came back for a second shot at that REM pod. Not quite as strong this time. Three lights, not four. was it for the activity hits on the equipment that first evening. That morning we would leave the room a little past 10 to head down to Camp Verde for a train ride. We wouldn't be back until later on that evening. In our absence, the room is absolutely quiet for hours. And then about 10 minutes past 1, the REM pod starts taking off. First it goes one light, then every once in a while two lights kick in. This would continue on from 1 o'clock, to 3 o'clock, to 4 o'clock, to 6 o'clock. It just never quit. Now during normal operation of one of these REM pod units, once you set it up, if it starts going off one light, it could be picking up some kind of outside interference from a strong radio frequency source or perhaps a fluorescent light source that's on the other side of a wall. Normally what you do is you just reduce the antenna one segment and it will stop. But there's nothing in the manual that says what happens if it should start doing this after it's been set up for hours and nothing's happened and it just won't quit. This is not necessarily activity per se, but what it does show is that the electromagnetic frequency of the room has changed or an electrical field has come through which is generating some kind of electromagnetic frequency and it is playing havoc with the EMF field that the unit itself puts out. Basically I would kind of liken this to when you walk into a room and your hair stands on end and you're not certain why it does it, that's pretty much what you're feeling. 
The other thing to note here is that only the REM pod is going off. First last night when it went off, and now today, the whole day that it's going off, and the cell sensors aren't going off at all. That shows that the frequency of whatever it's picking up is lower than the cell sensor units are able to pick up, which are set at no lower than 50 hertz because they're a piece of construction equipment. The REM pod picks up stuff that goes down into 20 hertz and below, and that's normally where activity, valid activity, is recorded at. We use the cell sensors as a first line indicator to let us know when something is passing quickly through the room, as when this activity seems to pass through quickly, apparently the frequency fluctuates up and down. And like a sine wave, it fluctuates high enough that the frequency is such that the cell sensors can pick it up. Now that's our experience in gathering captures and using our equipment. Others may debate that theory. Upon reviewing these surveillance tapes, I found out that at 402, the sound on the channel that carried the sound suddenly went out. I immediately figured that it had to have been something that I was reviewing with, the monitor. I replaced the monitor, that didn't work, so then I replaced the leads, that didn't work. Then I was worried that maybe the hard drive of the surveillance unit itself has gone out. That's the last thing you want to hear when you have information stored on it. Um, I checked the information on the drive as much as I could and there was nothing wrong with that so I thought maybe it was the motherboard but we've done other investigations since then and nothing's gone wrong with the motherboard after about an hour of trying to correct this issue I found by random chance that the audio was still there but it had transferred itself from audio track 1 to audio track 3 now anybody who's owned a DVR knows that when you hook up the preamp to it, you use an RCA plug to plug into the plug on the back of the unit to tell where the audio is going to input to. The only way to change from one track to the other is to physically remove that plug and to plug it into another plug indicating another track unless there's actually something wrong with the unit itself. And as I said, two more investigations down the road, there's nothing wrong with this unit. At 425 in the afternoon, after running for almost six hours now, the REM pod suddenly goes off as quickly as it came on. It did not come on again for the remainder of our stay. Two hours later, just as quick as the sound went off, it suddenly returned back on channel one. I don't have any answer for that. We've had all kinds of stuff happen with the equipment since we've been on sites. We've had cell sensors turn themselves off and then captured them on the camera turning themselves back on. Of course, batteries drain. Just when you think you've seen it all, something new happens. I'd have to say that if she was behind it, it was a pretty complicated thing for Faith, whatever her name was, to accomplish. Or did she? Clearly this is the railing that this uh, legend says that this Faith Summers put a rope around her neck and jumped over from. Pretty nice looking sights out here. Rose Blanche Williams died at the Haciampa Hotel on August 9, 1939 of a cerebral hemorrhage. She had had cirrhosis of the liver for two years prior to that and according to what this coroner put down, he had attended her from 1936 to 1939, a period of three years, and including the fact that it says that she lived in Prescott for six years prior to that. Now, as far as the cause of death, cerebral hemorrhage means that blood leaks inside, inside of the skull or leaks outside of the skull. Um, if you're under the age of 50, that's usually because of a blow to the head. She is over 50, she's 53, so it could also become another cause. Cirrhosis of the liver indicates alcoholism, and that's one of the causes that can lead to a cerebral hemorrhage. We know that she didn't bleed outside of the skull because they found out about it because one of these newfangled x-ray machines determined that there was blood leakage inside of the skull tissue. Um, the guy that reported it, Henry L. Williams, was also at the Haciampa Hotel. That's her husband. So they were staying there together. So what sets them out as far as a relationship to the other people that died in the hotel? When we do a search on Rose B. and Henry L. Williams, we have to go back to the 1930 census because by the time that the 1940 census comes along, she has already died. Uh, it shows that they also had some children. Their ages at that time were teenagers, so nine years later when she dies in Asiampa, they're probably grown. Maybe they were not with them on the trip. Maybe they were. In uh, 1930, it shows them living at 3237 Lakewood Avenue in Seattle. 
scroll into the end of that 1930 census, we can see that Henry L. lists his occupation as a mining engineer for an oil company, and that after the kids are listed, they also had a maid. The home that Henry and Rose owned in 1930 set on the shores of Lake Washington in Seattle, and there it is. Very ritzy for 1930 when the Depression's going on. Now it's just a guess, but my guess is that people like this would not stay in anything but the suite at the Hacienda, and there is only one, and that is room 426. A border crossing manifest in 1925 shows that Henry brought both Rose and her daughter Blanche across the border from Canada, where they both were born. Although Henry had his own money from being a petroleum engineer, his money was generational. Henry's father, also known as Henry L. Williams, the L stands for Lafayette, so we'll call one junior and one senior. Henry Sr. is very well known. Henry Sr. is credited by petroleum historians as being the first person to ever drill an offshore oil well. He did so in 1896 in a town next to Santa Barbara that he had incorporated called Summerlin. By the late 1800s, the entire Bay of Summerlin was completely covered in oil derricks. And now you know the rest of the story as to where Henry Jr. got his money from so that he could buy that big place in Seattle, go to college and become a petroleum engineer, and wind up hobnobbing around at the Hacienda. Historians have traced Henry Sr.'s movements. He was born in Missoula, Ohio in 1841, joined the Union Army after that, and after getting out of the Union Army when the war ended, he became a Treasury agent. The 1880 federal census from Ohio shows Henry Sr. to be listed as a special agent for the Treasury Department. It also shows his wife to be a woman named Sarah, and here's Henry L. Jr., the son. He was three years old in 1880, which means he's born in 1877. Henry Jr.'s Philadelphia, Pennsylvania baptismal records show that he was baptized on May 15th of 1878, born on December 27th of 1877, to Henry Lafayette Sr. and Sarah Catherine. Her last name is Everhart. Henry Jr. apparently stays in Prescott after Rose dies because on his 1942 draft registration card, which was a card of all males regardless of age, and he's now 64, he lists the Prescott, Arizona address. He also lists his correct date of birth as December 27, 1877. That's the same date that's on that Philadelphia, Pennsylvania baptismal page that has his father and his mother on it. The emergency contact information is shown to be an E.J. Ketchum on Everett Avenue in Seattle. That's Ernest J. Ketchum, and that's Blanche's husband. Blanche is the one, that daughter, that he brought across the border with him from Canada. He also still lists his occupation as self-employed mining and oil engineer. This pretty much senses the connection between him and between his dad, who was Henry Lafayette Williams Sr., and the Summerlin connection. When he dies in Phoenix, Arizona a year later, the coroner lists on the death certificate that his parents are H.L. Williams and Sarah Everhart. Those are the names that were on that 1878 baptismal certificate in Pennsylvania, which is what it says here, Pennsylvania. So this proves that this particular Henry L. Williams is the son of the original Henry L. Williams, which was the guy that dug that first offshore oil well in Summerlin, California. So why is this important? Why is all this tedious background important for the investigation at the Hacienda? Well, because Henry Williams Sr. isn't just known as the first guy to ever drill an offshore oil well. He didn't establish the town of Summerlin as some kind of an oil field community. He established the town of Summerlin as a spiritualist community. Henry Sr.'s first wife, Sarah Everhart, was a fervent spiritualist. She got him into it by having some people prove to him that spiritualism worked. They bought up the land near Santa Barbara, which was to become Summerlin, with the intent of creating a spiritualist community where spiritualists from all over the world could come and practice their art and then try to prove that the art worked to a skeptic scientific community. They sold plots of land that were 65 feet by 25 feet for people to build on. A lot of them they gave away for free. The word Summerland is a spiritualist name for heaven. Recall from your history lessons what spiritualism is. It is the mid-1800s to middle-1900s, I believe, that people can communicate with the dead through seances and transmediumship. This is different from ghost hunting, where we go into a place and run equipment, hoping to capture some activity and maybe, maybe just get a photo. These folks believe that together they could summon energies from the other side. Basically, if it wasn't haunted before they got there, it was haunted after they left, that's for sure. There was a lot of spiritualistic communities at that time around the world. 
Master Magician Herod Houdini spent much of his time during the early 1900s going around debunking them, showing that at least the ones that charged money to speak with dead relatives were nothing but out and out fakes. But as for Summerlin, they erected many structures where they practiced their art. And in fact, the location of that first oil well that Henry L. Williams dug in Summerlin was supposedly given to him in transmediumship. An article in the New Yorker referred to Summerlin as Spookville. There was so much reported paranormal activity in most of the old Victorian homes that most of them were raised. One home that was owned by one of the famous transmediums in the group became a famous haunted restaurant later on. The Big Yellow House restaurant, originally beige and owned by one of Henry Sr.'s best adepts, is so haunted that somebody even wrote a book about it. In 1975, Kim and Rod Latham authored a book called The Spirit of the Big Yellow House, in which they detailed the spiritualist community there in Summerlin and where the paranormal activity in the town comes from, a must-read if you're researching the area. On the page listing the leaders of the commune, we find H.L. Williams, who is Henry L. Williams Sr., and we find his second wife Agnes and a whole parcel of her kids, and then we also find H.L. Williams Jr., who years later after leaving the cult would find himself in the Haciampa Hotel watching his wife die of a cerebral hemorrhage. So what were Henry Jr. and Rose doing in the Haciampa? Just a vacation? Did they come there to try to do a seance? Maybe they'd heard about this Faith Summers character and they were trying to contact her. Or maybe they ran seances for a couple of days and they were the ones which said that they got information about someone that committed suicide and they actually started the legend themselves. Obviously, being raised in a spiritualist compound, Henry Jr. watched mediums at work every day. Whether it was one or not, nobody knows. Whether he chose Rose to be his wife because she also held the belief is also something nobody knows. I did find a notation on one of daughter Blanche's certificates after she married E.J. Ketchum that stated that her religion was that of Christian science. That was what most spiritualists claimed that they converted to in order to get away from the spiritualist moniker once it became taboo in modern society. Did Rhodes suffer some kind of cerebral episode while engaged in some kind of transmedium effort to contact the dead? Or did she just tie one on and fall out of the bathtub and hit her head? One thing is for certain, Rose is one of the few deaths that can be confirmed that occurred at the Haciampa, and probably the only death that occurred in room 426. She either is directly responsible for the activity in the room, or indirectly responsible because of something that was invited in. But all things considered, I can see why the Hotel Haciampa website sticks with the Faith Summer story. Much better to offer the explanation as to why sometimes guests vacate the room early as sticking with the story about a young jilted bride who takes her own life after her new husband doesn't return from a grocery run. A story that anyone could emphasize with, especially the women in the crowd who would be like, Oh, she must be a very sad ghost. I hope she shows up in the room so that I can talk with her. Compare that with the alternate story of, Well, we rented the room to a bunch of spiritualists, they held some seances, and now we think it might be infested. As Paul Harvey would have said, and now you know the rest of the story. Good day. We gave the Haciampa Inn an activity level rating of low and consistent. There was enough activity responses and other minor occurrences to let us know that there is activity in this room. Probably if we would have stayed longer than the two days we were there, it would have escalated. We know personally that other people have experienced it because a couple of years ago we had tried to book this room, was told that it had already been rented out for the two days we were in town, and upon arriving and taking pictures of the lobby, we're told that we could go ahead and rent the room if we wanted to because the individual had paid up front, had vacated it after only an hour. I would encourage others who have such equipment to go in and run surveillance and try to see if they can pick up something over a longer period of time.